Journey Church, we really do believe there's hope for everyone, and that includes you today. Hey, if we've not had the privilege to meet, my name is Keith. I'm the fearless leader of Journey Church here in Bend, and what a great privilege that we get to be together today. I really believe that God is going to meet with you today, and there's going to be some great change that happens in your heart. We want to welcome all those watching online, wherever you're watching around the world. Can y'all just shout hello to those watching online? Hello. For whatever reason you're not here, we just want you to know you're loved and we're grateful we get to be together and we hope that you'll make plans to be here in person soon. Man, let's just take care of some family business up front. All the ladies in the house. Ladies, you've got a ladies night this Friday. It's a bunco night. That's, a, that's just a Christian form of gambling right there, all right? There's a $10 registration fee. You can sign up at journeyandben.com. We want to make sure that, ladies, if you want to get to know some other people, this is a great opportunity for you to have fun. That's this Friday. Sign up at journeyandben.com. Men, I'm not leaving you out, all right? We're not going to have any of that Christian gambling stuff. This is going to be an epic game night, all right? It's going to be on Saturday, March 19th. 
This is totally free. So guys, you got no excuse, all right? You want to get to know some other guys, come have some fun and some men nights. That's a way for the ladies and for the guys to get connected. You know, today is Growth Track Step 1 right now happening in this service. If you're wondering how to get connected, how can you serve here? We call our volunteer superheroes. If you want to be a superhero, you go through Growth Track. We got Growth Track Step 1, the first Sunday of the month, number 2, the second Sunday, number 3, the third Sunday. It's how you get on a dream team, how you can be a member here at Journey Church and be on mission together. God is doing so many great things through His church. You see, His church is made up of people. When you give to Journey Church, you're actually giving to God what is already rightfully His. When we give here, we give on mission. I love what God's doing here. You can give in so many different ways and different forms. And let me just tell you, if you're visiting here today, we don't want your money. We're not going to pass a bucket or a bag or ask you to give money. But when you call Journey Church home, you say, I'm given to the mission of God. And I'll tell you, it doesn't just impact the people in Central Oregon. It's beyond as well. We support a great ministry in Uganda called STARS. They reach out to disabled kids because in Africa, many times, disabled uh, people are, are marginalized. They don't have the means for transportation. They're often not uh, able to get an education. In fact, some people look at the disabled in Africa as cursed by God. But we know that God does not make mistakes. We know that any disability is actually an opportunity to give glory to God. And so STARS has an incredible ministry that reaches out to those who are disabled, but last year their van broke down. And because of your generosity, Journey Church, we decided to step up and get them a van. And they just got that van and they sent us some pictures. So because of your generosity, we're getting to see the kingdom expanded in places like Uganda. And I'll tell you what, this is exactly what Jesus would do. Jesus used so many different examples of, of who he loves and who he reaches. And I just want you to know because of your generosity, you get to see the work of God done in such great and tangible ways. If you want to go see STARS ministry in action and you want to see the work of God in Uganda, we're hoping to go two times this year, once in August and another time in November. We're going to have an informational meeting next Sunday right after the 11 o'clock service. You're most welcome to come to that information meeting and see if this might be right for you to go to Uganda this year. Well, as we continue, we're going to sing some more songs, and I'll join you back up in just a moment for a message. I want to just ask that you prepare your heart. There's a lot of crazy things happening in this world. Can I hear an amen? There's a lot of crazy things, but I've got good news for you. God never stops being God. He is still in charge, and He's still in control. And I want you to know the power of God wants to work in your life as well. It, it can be a little confusing wondering, how, how do I pray in a world full of chaos? I'll tell you, Jesus said, if you have prayer like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Mountains in the scriptures are, are, are an image of obstacles. And just last week, I, I was speaking with some pastors about what's happening in Ukraine. And as we were together, they actually got a text message from those who are in Ukraine about what's happening. The church is praying. And when, you, when we're praying for war that's happening, I tell you, God is working in ways that you may not even know it. See, we're hearing testimonies of, of literal missiles disappearing in the air. Bombs that hit the ground and they don't explode. Stories of Christians who are in their living room and they, they leave to go to the store and they come back and a, a bomb hit their apartment. We're seeing miracle after miracle. And I'll tell you, there is suffering. There are people dying. This is an opportunity for God to show us that He works and He moves in suffering. So I'm asking you, church, now is the time for us to be moved to prayer. Now is the time not for us to sit back and say the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but for us to say now is the time for us to watch God do what He does best. We may not see it, we may not experience it right now, but we should be asking to have the heart of God. So I'm just asking you today, you might have a war happening in your own heart. Maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a, a family situation, maybe it's something happening in your heart. I want you to know God wants to work in your life as well. If you're able to, would you stand to your feet? We're going to pray. We're going to invite the Spirit of God to move in this place. I want to ask you right now, would you believe in your heart that God wants to move through the church? Lord, would you move through your church right where we are? I ask Spirit of the living God that you would awaken us, that we would be reminded of who you are, that you're a God that works in all history. We pray right now, even for those that might seem like an enemy, we pray right now that you would turn lost hearts to you. 
We pray for Putin to experience the grace of a living God. We ask, God, that you would draw people to yourself, that you would protect the church in Ukraine. We ask, God, that you would move in mighty ways, perform miracles because that's who you are, the miracle-working God. We ask, God, for you to be glorified in the midst of suffering, that we would experience the power of the resurrection. Right here, even in the midst today, I ask, Spirit of God, would you be working in our hearts? May there be hearts that turn to you. We give you our sins. We confess. We repent. We turn to you and say, God, have your way today. Spirit of God, would you fall afresh on your church today? Oh, God, I pray for a movement even right now as we sing to you that we would see you're worthy, for you are holy, you are good, God. Oh, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Have your way today, I pray. If you're in agreement, would you just shout amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
when you know the name of Jesus, it changes everything. When you, you show up on a day like today with other people and we sing these songs, if you're new to church, you see the words on the screen and you think, what is this, like Christian karaoke? Like, what, what are we doing? I'll tell you, it's not Christian karaoke. What we're doing is we're singing praise to God. Some call this worship, but worship is not a matter of singing. It's a matter of the heart. And when you know what Jesus has done for you, you have something to sing about. When you understand who he is and how it changes who you are, that it just you, you can't help but sing. You don't care if you're on key. You don't care what you sound like. You don't care if it's loud. You don't care what you look like. And you're not loud for loud's sake. You're not looking weird for weird's sake. You just want to give your life to God. So when we come here, we're, we're, we're giving glory back to Jesus because he doesn't change. We want to reflect what he's doing in our lives and say, we want more of you. We want more of you. We want more of you. So right where you are, would you just invite God to speak to you through the power of his word? See, the Bible is no ordinary book. This is the living word of God. And the word of God can go into places in your heart that no one else can go. A preacher can't go there. A counselor and therapist can't go there. A doctor can't go there. A parent can't go there. A spouse can't go there, but God can. So if you'd be willing, he, he wants to do something in your life today. Let's, let's, Lord, would you speak to our hearts? Would you have your way today? We thank you that we get an opportunity to spend time with you together, to remember that we are your church. We want to fulfill your mission that, that Jesus, not even the gates of hell will prevail against your church that you're building. So give us vision, give us clarity. I just pray for an anointing of the power of your spirit to, to work today that dry bones will come to life today that broken dreams would be restored today. That, that sinners would be set free today from strongholds that have shackled them for years and decades and potentially even generations today would be broken today in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, we thank you for the power of who you are, that it changes us. So I, I ask, Lord, that your word would get into our hearts and shape us and change us to be more like you. I pray in Jesus' name, so be it, and amen, and amen. We sure do have a lot of distractions in this world today, don't we? Between work, I mean, I know some of you are so busy, you're working full, long days. Then, of course, if you've got a family, I mean, having a family today, that's some serious stuff. You've you got to go from one place to another place. Then, of course, entertainment is back. I mean, it's so great that we're starting to see concerts again and sporting events and movies are coming back into the theater. And so all of a sudden, our, our tensions are being pulled in one way or another. And then, of course, we, we've all got our health to take, take care of. I mean... Don't you ever notice that sickness never comes at a good time? You always get sick at the worst time. Or, or you get hurt at the worst time. Or, or you, you find out a diagnosis at the worst time. And there are, there are so many distractions today. And, of course, we can't forget about the last few years. Remember that pandemic we all went through? Man, that sucked. I mean, that was traumatic. And we can't just ignore what we've been through, and I'll tell you why, because when you experience trauma, it actually impacts you. And we've all experienced trauma, but the unique thing about this pandemic is it actually impacted all of us. So one of the things we need to just recognize is we've all got some issues that we can't ignore that we've got to give back to God, that we've got to allow God to heal the places that were wounded or to restore that which is not right. We've, got, we've literally got to collectively acknowledge that we've been through a lot. And then now, all of a sudden, we're witnessing a war unlike anything else since World War II. So no generation has experienced what we're experiencing right now. So it appears that there's an opportune time for us to depend on the Lord unlike any other time. And in the midst of all of these uncertainties in the world that we're facing, God is still God. 
There is not a single thing that ever happens that surprises God. I know it may seem like it sometimes, but God knows everything. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 54, he said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south winds blowing, you say there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. The equivalent to this today is Jesus would say, you look at your app and you know what the weather will be today. <laughs> you know it will be cold. You know what the high and the low will be. You, you know that there will be snow flurries. or You have an idea of what's going to happen based on what's happening in the sky. And Jesus uses this illustration, he says in verse 56, You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Right, let, let me put this in terms that we might understand. Why do you open up the weather app more than you open up the Bible app? Why do you care more about the weather than how God's actually tangibly working in the ways of this world? Now, I'm one that is like you, that it's easy to talk about the weather. When I don't know what else to talk about, I talk about the weather. I mean, being a pastor can kind of be weird sometimes. It's hard to have conversations with people because they feel like they have to have spiritual conversations with the pastor. Even worse is I know nothing about sports, so it's hard to have sports conversations. I don't know who made a point or a touchdown or a basket or which sport that belongs to. So sometimes what I do is what Jesus is saying, like, let's talk about the weather. It's cold again. <laughs> Sun came out again. I <laughs> wonder if it's going to go down, you know. Like, we, we just have these kind of shallow conversations. And, and this is what Jesus is trying to teach us, is that the cultural events should be viewed through the lens of kingdom events. That what's happening in this world should actually point us to a greater world. You see, there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of this world. And when we talk about kingdom, we, we put it in this way. There's a king and his ways, which Jesus is the king. And he has a kingdom. And he taught us to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we don't have to wait to get to heaven to start experiencing heaven. But Jesus says what, what begins to happen is we see the things happening in this world. And we're not looking at it through the lens of cultural events. And the reason this is so important is nothing should surprise us because what we ought to be doing is going to the Word of God saying, God, would you speak through this book that I'm not caught off guard by what's happening in the world? Whether it's evil or whether it's good or whatever events are happening, awaken my understanding of this world to who you are. We're currently studying the book of Esther. Everyone shout Esther. Esther. Esther is one of 66 books that we find in the Bible, and as we read this ancient book written 2,500 years ago, we find an application for our lives. It deals with corrupt governments. It deals with power. It deals with gender inequality, the role of a woman in society. It deals with racism, which is a reality that still exists today because the issues we deal with today are not new. And I absolutely mean that. I was on a plane this week, and you ever have someone next to you that you, don't, you totally don't know, they're a stranger, but they have their phone open, and you can't help but look at what are they looking at? <laughs> I mean, you just feel like you're snooping a little bit, but like you got your phone open, we're sitting together, so like, I just happened to look at a guy next to me, and he, he said some of the most racist things on a text message that I've ever seen, and I, I just, I so badly wanted to prophesy out loud over him. I, I, it made me sick to my stomach, and there are people today that, that have a hard time understanding what racism is because of political issues and tensions, and they wonder, does racism even exist in a place like Bend? Absolutely. It exists in the world today, and, and it exists because of what we read in books like Esther, because it's generational. Until Jesus comes and restores all that is wrong, there will continue to be sin. So we need to have our hearts awakened to what sin is, who a Savior is, and how the world can be right, including our hearts. And as we read the book of Esther, we, we see these real events happening in real time, played out 2,500 years ago. They still happen today. If you're just joining us, let me just go through some key characters so that you know where we're at in this story. We learn of a king in chapter 1 named King Ahasuerus. That's his Hebrew name. His Persian name is Xerxes. 
He's a real person. It's not a fictional story. You can study him in history. He's known as Xerxes the Great. At Journey, we call him Xerxes the Jerxes. And if you're wondering why we would give him that nickname, all you've got to do is look at history and see that this guy did some horrific evil things. He's the king over the Medo-Persian Empire, which is the largest empire on the planet at the time of, of this writing. King Azuer, Xerxes, ends up marrying Queen Esther. Now, I don't think that Esther just has her whole life figured out because Esther had a hard knock life. She's a lot like little orphan Annie. She lost her parents and she, she was a Jewish orphan girl. And at the time of this writing, there could be no more vulnerable of a person and a position than being a Jewish orphan girl in Persia. She had no chance of surviving. She has an older cousin named Mordecai that ends up adopting her as his daughter. Mordecai is a man that we can model after. He's a, he's a man of character. He's a man of integrity. He's a man that protects. He, he's a man that does what is right. We, we need more men like Mordecai. Amen. And then we're introduced to another man named Haman. Haman, who will be central to this story and the focus of today's topic. Haman is the Hitler in this story, literally. Haman wants to annihilate all of the Jewish people in the entire Persian Empire because he was offended by Mordecai. Mordecai, a man of character, refused to bow down to Haman. Haman happened to be a government leader who wanted the entire world to bow down to him. When Mordecai refused, Haman decided not just to get back to Mordecai, but to eliminate the entire Jewish population in Persia. And as we pick up in the story today, we will see a principle that's woven throughout the scriptures that's still true today, and it's the principle of sowing. That what you reap, you sow. A few weeks ago, we put it this way, what you seek, you find. And this is true. It seems incredibly simple, but it's profound when you start to understand this. You will not get a garden if you don't plant the seeds. <laughs> So somewhere there's some, some work in our lives that you have exactly what you are investing in in your life. We see this over and over. The way that Paul writes it to the Galatians, he said, if, if you're not happy or if you're not satisfied, if you're not experiencing the spiritual life that you want in your life, here's how he words it in Galatians 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. So some of us actually blame God for the spiritual state we're in. When in reality, we haven't put in what we need to in this relationship with the Lord. So he goes on to detail and he puts it this way. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Now the flesh is an imagery of what you want. It's your life. It's my desires. So if you reap, if you want what you want, you're going to get it. And we're going to see this in the life of Haman clearly today. But the one who sows to the Spirit, and you'll notice the Spirit is capitalized. This is the person of God. So if you go to God, if you give God everything, if you're willing to surrender your whole heart to God Almighty through the power of God Himself, the Holy Spirit, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. See, what you're investing in your life is what you will experience in the wisdom of Proverbs, we're warned in chapter 26, verse 27, whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. Come on, some of you can relate to this. I'm not alone in this. There are times that I say things, words will come out of my mouth, or maybe a tone will come out of my mouth, and I realize what came out. You ever been there? You start back paddling. I didn't mean it that way. That, that's not what I said. I mean, I would hear, let me explain what I meant by what I actually said, but because what I said is what I didn't mean to say because what I meant to say is, and my wife will say this, you're digging yourself a hole. <laughs> just stop while you're ahead because that, that hole's just getting deeper. It, it's, an, it, it's an image in the scriptures that a pit is destruction. A pit is a bad place. A pit is a place you don't want to be. David uses this imagery even further. Listen to what he says in Psalm 7, verse 14. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. 
So you, you can get pregnant with evil because of your decisions, and then it will eventually give birth to lies that you actually believe in. You look at these demonic babies in your life and be like, where'd those come from? <laughs> you had a part of that. And so he, he continues in this in verse 15. He says, he makes a pit. This is the imagery again. He makes a pit, digging it, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull, his violence descends. See, you could be digging your own pit and not even know it. You don't even know it because you're just trying to survive. You're just, you're just trying to go through the motions. You're just trying to succeed. You're, you're just looking at the world, and you're wondering, what do I do? And so as you're doing it, you're digging this pit that if you go in, you may not come out. Now, I've got great news for you if you read the Psalms. David wants you to know there's no pit too deep that God can't rescue you out of. I mean, it's David that says he rescued me from the pit. He, he, he got me out of the miry clay. You don't, you don't need to stay in that pit that you got yourself into. God is so great in his grace that he will get us out of that mess. He'll return our feet on solid ground. His rock, he restores us to this place. And Haman is an image of that one that digs his pit, and we will see that he will hang on his own gallows. Esther is an image of obedience, and we see what happens when you invest in life, you get life, even if you don't see it coming. Because Esther is a deep reminder that when it looks like it's over, it's not over with God. That your trials, your tribulations, your hardships, the hell that you've been through is actually an opportunity for God to work in your life. Oh, let me, let me put it this way. All of your problems are a reminder that if you have a mountain in front of you, that by your faith you are on the precipice of a breakthrough, that God's going to move that because of who he is, not because of who you are. The breakthrough is coming in Jesus' name. But you've got to decide what will you invest in. Oh, Jeremiah, the prophet, speaks on behalf of the Lord, and he says, you will seek me and find me. But there's a condition here. When you seek me with all your heart. We've been conditioned to have a cultural Christianity that you can have one foot in your world and in your life and then one foot in faith and that somehow that God's going to bless your faith and your life and somehow we could commingle these things. And what the author is saying in Jeremiah, God speaking to his people is God wants every area of your heart, everything. He wants everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. He's so great he can handle everything in your life, the trauma, the brokenness the betrayals, the hardship, everything you've got. God said, give me everything. And that's exactly what Esther does when she finds out about what Haman is plotting to do. Mordecai speaks into her life, and in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai says to Esther, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And this scripture is alive today to every single one of us that is breathing today. Who knows whether you're not alive right now in this world for such a time as this. That God actually has a plan for you in your life right where you are in the position you find yourself in. You say, well, you don't understand my, my situation, Pastor. I came from this background or this background. I may not understand your situation, but the God that knew Esther's situation knows your situation, and he's able to work with it. Whether you're an orphan or whether you've got a death sentence on your head or whether you are in the place of brokenness, I'm here to tell you that God is able to resurrect even the dead. So Haman is going to invest. He, Haman is going to sow into sin. He's going to sow into sin, and he will reap what he invests in. Esther is going to sow into life. And when you sow into life, you may not see it right now, but the harvest is coming. So we pick up in this story, Esther chapter 7 Starting with verse 1. At this point, Esther has the courage to confront the king. She realizes she's risking her life. She could die. She comes before the king. She finds favor. The king says, what would you like? Ask anything you want. And Esther says, will you have dinner with me, you and Haman? The king says, of course I will. 
So they have dinner together. And at the dinner, the king says, what would you like? Ask whatever you want, and it's yours. And Esther, we, we were wondering in the story, what's she going to do? And she says, hey, king, will you and Haman have dinner with me again tomorrow night? She missed her first opportunity. She missed her second opportunity. We're wondering in this story, Esther, what are you waiting for? And if you missed last week, we saw God's providence that even when it looks like a missed opportunity, it's actually God getting you ready for something greater. Then Mordecai, who looks like he was missed over for something good he had done earlier in, in, in saving the king from an assassination plot, he, he got no reward for that in the moment. Later on, he got that reward. He sowed life, and later he reaped life. So now we're pick up in the story. This is going to be the third chance that this is, this is now the dinner, the second dinner. So the king and Haman, verse 1 of chapter 7, the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, come on, second day of eating, that's a good meal right there. You just keep coming back. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, there's a lot of wine in the story of Esther. A lot of wine. And what we learn in the book of Esther, chapter 1 particularly, is when you get married with wine, one way of saying when you're wasted drunk, you make some bad decisions. So when we read the book of Esther, it's not just giving you permission to drink as much wine as you want whenever you want. I tell you, when you read the book of Esther, it ought to relate to the times that we're living in that not much has changed. And we look at the Bible and say, how is this relevant to my life today? It's very relevant. It's just like all your friends. So here they are. The second day, they're drinking wine. And after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Here's her third opportunity. Some of you think you missed your first opportunity. Some of you think you missed your second opportunity. I'm telling you, the third opportunity is coming. And this is when Esther, in verse 3, then... At this moment, you should allow your heart to palpitate the way hers did. She's got adrenaline rushing through her body. This is her moment. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. It appears this is the first time that Esther aligns her background, that she's Jewish, with her people. She's making a bold stance. The edict has already gone out that the Jewish people must be destroyed. And she goes on and says this in verse 4, For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and killed and to be annihilated. And if we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. She's saying, we're going to die. If we were just slaves, I wouldn't even bring this up because people would be alive. But I'm, I'm telling you, this is the end of my people. I am one of them. And look at the response to the king. He clearly respects Esther. Then King Azuera said to Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? Is it another, another king? Is it another kingdom? Who did this? We're going to track them down. And look at Esther with her courage, shoulder back and chin up. And Esther said, I'm imagining like a court scene. You know those court scenes where, 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 where someone's a witness and they said, who, who done it, right? And it's what Esther did. She gets out her finger like this, all right? And Esther said, a foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. I pointed this way because earlier I pointed over there and everybody looked over there like <laughs> just being really careful with my gestures here. <laughs> this wicked Haman. Then Haman dropped his wine, dropped his fork, his, his jaw dropped. He was terrified before the king and the queen. C can you see this in your, in your mind here? The, this, the image is, is so clear, we, we need not Hollywood to replicate this for us to understand what's happening in this story. She calls him out publicly. She doesn't do it privately. She doesn't send a text message. She doesn't send an email. She actually publicly professes, this is the problem right here. And so we see two parallels to our lives today. And I want you to examine in your own heart who you are, because the warning for us today is this. 
Haman can slip into your heart incredibly easily. I mean, the spirit of Haman can come into your life and you don't even know it. Usually other people know it, but you, you don't traditionally know it. But if you want to be like an Esther, I want to warn you, it won't happen by accident. It will require intentionality. It will require hard work, but I've got good news for you. The best things in life are hard and they're worth it. So we see Esther, Esther acts in humility. We would say the spirit, as Paul said to the Galatians. Haman acts in the flesh. We would call that sin. So Haman is a representation of sin. Esther is a representation of life, of obedience. The warning of Proverbs goes like this. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A prideful person does not see the destruction that's to come. They only see the success as it was the case with Haman. He, he saw his great family. He saw his great career success. He saw everything but his own destruction that was coming. And that's exactly what sin will do in your life. You, you will only focus on how you can find satisfaction and success. See, the reality is the flesh is natural. I, haven't you noticed this, the, the, the sinful nature that just happens when you step into the world? David says, I was born a sinner in Psalm 51. All of us are born in sin. So this is good news for all of us. You didn't just, you just, didn't, didn't be, you just become a sinner. It's because of your parents. Blame them. <laughs> and when you step into the world, the most natural thing to do is, is to want things for you. You never hear a baby say, Mom, that's enough. You, you fed me enough. You've done enough for me. Like, what can I do for you? No, baby just says, Mama, I'm hungry, and you're giving me something to eat. I'm dirty. Somebody's got to clean me up. I got to get someplace. Somebody else is going to take me there. Now, that sin nature of caring about self, and I don't mean to say that babies are, are just nothing but sinners and evil. That's not my point. They're beautiful. They're gifts from God. They're, they're his blessing. They're, they're, they're our quiver that God has planned for us, our heritage. So, so don't miss my point here. Here's my bigger point here. There comes a point in our lives that we recognize that I am destined for something more than just getting. And so humility is not natural. Humility actually says, I've been given a lot. How do I give back? And as is the case of Esther, when you actually have humility and consider others greater than yourself, it's not just serving other people, it's saving other people. Let's look at this even more carefully, what happened with Haman. Haman gets angry at Mordecai. This man has got issues. He's angry at Mordecai, so he says, I'm going to annihilate all of your people. It's crazy what anger will do. When you act on your feelings instead of faith, you will make decisions that are disastrous. Now, your feelings are real, and they can and should be validated. Paul writes it like this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry, so you will be offended, you will be hurt, someone will do something to you, but be angry and do not sin. Don't do something you shouldn't do just because you're angry. Don't justify it because you're angry. And then he gives this great counsel. Listen up, married folk. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Most fights happen in a home late at night. It's when you're tired. It's when you let your guard down. The enemy takes advantage of that and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that you not only fight, but I want to make sure you don't reconcile because it's never a good thing. You go to bed angry. You will not wake up better the next day. You are not a freed person when you wake up after a night of sleeping in anger. So here's what begins to happen when you are, go to bed angry. You, you start thinking about what you can do to the other person, what you wish over the other person, the, the ill will towards the other person. Or you start justifying how you were hurt and what's wrong with the situation. Anger starts so small. It starts with an offense. And then he gives this counsel. Hear this clearly in verse 27. He says, and give no opportunity to the devil. Some translations say give no foothold to the devil. I want to focus on this for just a moment because when you're angry, it's an opportunity for the devil to work in your life. What does he mean by that? Well, let's look at the word opportunity that's translated in some translations as foothold. The word in the Greek is tapas. Tapas. I'm going to put it on the screen so you think I'm smarter than I actually am. The word tapas, if we were to look at the actual literal definition of tapas, it's a place, it's a dwelling, 
It's, it's a portion that's marked off. It could be translated an inhabited place, like a home. This is the word that would be translated real estate. So when Paul says, when you're angry, do not sin. Don't go to bed angry. Don't let the sun go down on your angry anger because don't give an opportunity for the devil. He's saying, don't give real estate to the devil. Don't give a place for the devil. Here's what he's saying. Your heart is a dwelling place. So inside of you, as Jeremiah told us in chapter 29, verse 13, when you go after God with your whole heart, what do you get? All of God. He inhabits your whole heart. You've given your real estate, your whole heart to the Lord. Now, when you're angry and you don't deal with that anger, now, how do you deal with that anger? When you're angry, if you go immediately to God, God gets to work in your life. You're given an opportunity. You're giving the real estate of your heart back to God. How? Because when you're angry, you actually have reasons to justify poor behavior. So here's what you do. You pray for the supernatural. What do I mean by supernatural? For you to forgive someone you don't want to forgive. So you go to God and you ask him to give you the revelation of how much you've offended him and how much he has forgiven you. And you have the realization if God has forgiven me this much, how dare I say I can't forgive someone else? So the Spirit of God starts stirring in your heart. Well, I still don't want to forgive them, Lord. You gave me that revelation to forgive them, but I still don't want to do it. So you pray and you say, God, speak to me through the power and the promise of your word. And you go through God's word and you, 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 you meditate on it and you rehearse it and you, you let God's word be a lamp into your feet and a, a, a light into your feet and a lamp into your path. And you go where God wants you to go. You don't go into sin. Are, are you seeing how you can give God an opportunity to have the real estate of your heart? Okay, you don't know what else to do. You put worship songs on. You start worshiping. You don't give an opportunity for the devil. You spew on this long enough, it will turn into sin. You'll say things you regret. You'll turn to some other substance to start to forget about your anger. You will sin if you don't give it back to God. If you don't give it back to God, the devil moves in like your heart is his real estate. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the devil is a thief. He will steal what's not his. He won't pay for this real estate. He'll move into your heart, and next thing you know, you'll start acting like the devil. You'll start speaking like the devil. You'll start living like the devil, and you won't even know it. So when you have anger, you've got to give it to God, or else the devil's going to sneak into your life. And this, this happens really clearly here, where this is an opportunity and here's why we see this in verse 29. He continues. This is Paul writing to the church here. This is what Haman did. Let no corrupt talking come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do you know what Haman did when he was angry? He got his wife together. He got his friends together. And he's going off about how successful he is. Yeah, I'm so good with my, my, my business. I'm so good with my finances. I'm so good with my family. And he said, but there's one thing missing in my life. I hate Mordecai. There was corrupt talk. And when you have corrupt talk, you will reap corruption. So Haman's wife and his friends say, then why don't you kill Mordecai? Why don't you get rid of him? The conclusion should be death because sin will always lead to death. And my friends, we're not exempt from this corruption. When the Spirit gives you revelation to see things that are happening in this world, it's everywhere, even in your own heart. I'm shocked by that. You go to Twitter, and incredibly intelligent people in our nation say the most vile, evil things corrupt things towards our current president, towards the past president, towards Supreme Court justices, and they justify it because they're angry. Corrupt talk. Just Twitter. You, okay, y'all aren't on Twitter? Go to Facebook then. You just don't want to go to Facebook? Turn on the news. You're going to see corrupt talk. And you're not careful. Here's, here's where it goes. It happens in your home. It happens in your workplace. It happens with your neighbor. It happens at restaurants. It happens at the grocery store. It will happen everywhere you go. People just spew, I'll tell you what's wrong with, I'll tell you this, that person, an idiot, this person. It'll happen everywhere. It'll happen so badly that if it's in your heart and you gave real estate to the enemy, you'll just be at a roundabout and you'll start cursing strangers you don't even know. <laughs> It'll, it will happen everywhere. You'll call someone an idiot that you actually have no clue what's going on in their heart. So here's what Paul says. You're not going to behave like that when you have Jesus. 
You, you give him back the real state of your heart and say, change it, fill, fill me up, because Jesus says it's out of the overflow of the heart that one speaks. So your words are not sin. Your words came from your heart. A little bit of gut check. There are no accidental words like, oops, it just slipped out. Nope, that was in there. <laughs> Jesus say, nobody else can see it, but I can see it. No, no pretending to be a good Christian, no such thing. You follow Jesus, you, you give him everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. So look at verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So when you're angry, when you have corrupt talk, it seriously makes God sad. You grieve the Holy Spirit. Here's why. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you believe in Jesus, God the Holy Spirit makes your heart his home. Here's the great news. If you believe in Jesus, you're sealed once and for all. You are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit that one day when you die, you actually start living. You have the great inheritance of the hope of eternal life, this place called heaven. That's going to be so good. No sorrow, no sin, no more achy pains, no more, oh, no more problems at all. Heaven's going to be so good. But on this side of heaven, when you're angry and you sin, you grieve the Holy Spirit. God is so sad. You know what makes God sad? You are not experiencing what he wants for you. Do you think the Lord just wants you to look at the world and say, oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Might as well be grumpy and complain about it the rest of my life. I, I, I might as well make this world even worse. No, you know what the Holy Spirit is saying to you? The whole world could be going to hell. And because of me, you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Out of me will come the overflow of what's absolutely impossible that even to the point of death, you can say, if I live, it's going to be for Christ. If I die, it's going to be a gain. I've got the Lord in my heart. He owns all my real estate. But it grieves the Holy Spirit when, when you just give the enemy just a little bit. Oh, the Holy Spirit, God himself says, oh, I've got such a better plan. I know you're angry. I know you've been hurt and offended. And the Lord will look at us and say, I have been too. Learn from me. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness, bitterness is the cancer of the soul. If you don't kill it, bitterness will be like the gallows that Haman built and they will be high. And more than likely, you're not going to kill the person you're angry with. You are building your own gallows. And wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So here's the instruction. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. What would the world look like if the church did that? Come on. Doesn't it sound so simple? But when you're angry, it's not easy to be kind. <laughs> When you're hurt, when you see the world and its wickedness, it's not easy to be like, okay, the Lord told me to pray for my enemies. I'm going to pray for you. Usually we have to do it with a little bit of cynical, jaded, like, man, you're stupid. I'll pray for you. <laughs> that, that, that's not exactly what Paul's talking about. It grieves God. Bitterness is the business of the devil to destroy what God wants to do in your life. So what does Esther do? She knows the sin, and here's what she does. She confronts the sin. To obey the Lord is to confront the sin, and is to confess the sin. She didn't keep it to herself. She didn't say, well, that's a, I'm, that's a sin I'm going to tolerate. That's a sin I'm going to ignore. You know, maybe we should drink some more wine so I could forget about this sin. She, she didn't just ignore this. She didn't numb it like many of us do. And by the way, I, I can make a joke about wine being the issue, but we all have our vices that we numb sin. We all do. After the first service, I had somebody tell me, my vice is cleaning. And she said, everybody says that's not a big deal because when I clean, it's like, that's great. you got a clean house. But she says, you know what I do when I'm cleaning? I'm rehearsing the bitterness in my mind. She's like, so what looks like it's good to everybody else, it doesn't benefit me. So she's like, you've completely changed my view of how I'm cleaning. She says, now I need to start praying. I need to start worshiping. And the reason she even said that to me is my, my vice growing up was, was sugar. I grew up in a broken household, so I kept turning to sugar, and then it just became a joke, like, oh, yeah, pastor loves sugar, pastor loves sugar. And then I went through root, and I realized that's a stronghold in my life. I haven't dealt with some deeper issues. I go to sugar because it makes me feel good. It get, releases the dopamines in my mind, and all of a sudden I just forget about the issues. So it's not just alcohol. It's, it's not just uh, marijuana. It's not just uh, pornography. It could be a whole slew of different things that if you're not giving God everything, you've numbed the situation in your life. So now I have to confess my sin to y'all. So you see me walk in a candy store. 
there, there better be some intervention, Pastor. You doing okay today? I get real with you. You can get real with me. Let's finish this story. And the king, this is what happens. The king, he arose in his wrath. He's so angry. He arose from the wrath of the wine drinking and went to the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. For he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. Isn't that interesting? The very guy that wants to annihilate the Jews is now actually begging from a Jew to save his life. And while he's doing it, verse 8, And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. As Haman was falling on the couch, in, in the Persian culture, they would eat meals at a couch. They would actually, they would lay on the couch while they eat. That, we should bring that tradition back. <laughs> Here she is at the couch, at the dinner table. He's begging over the couch. And as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence? Some translations say, will he molest the queen in front of me? In my own house? Uh, the, the Jewish tradition, rabbis would teach this, is not in the Bible, but the, the Jewish tradition, they would actually say that Gabriel, who, who, whom they couldn't see, the angel Gabriel, pushed Haman on the couch right when the king walked in. <laughs> I love that tradition, but <laughs> as the word left the mouth of the king, who is this guy doing this to my wife? They covered Haman's face. He didn't even see it coming. That's what sin will do. You don't even see your own fall coming. You, you cover up your face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attendants of the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman's prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king. Mordecai, who saved you, king, that, that the gallows is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. That's 75 feet high. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. I need you to see these parallels really clearly. Haman represents sin. Esther represents life. And I, I want to just compare these for just a moment because Haman teaches us a lot about sin. Sin will destroy your life. Here's what Haman teaches us about sin. Number one is generational. We don't always like to say that, but here, here's the reality. We justify our poor behaviors because of our family backgrounds. We say things like this. Oh, you're just angry because your daddy was angry. Oh, you're an addict because we come from a family of addicts. Oh, here's the reason for your attitude. You're Italian. I'll tell you why. All Italians act this way. You know, that's just who you are. Sin will justify generationally the curses that the enemy wants to keep in your family. I'll tell you why I say that. Haman was called an Agagite five times in the book of Esther. Five times he's called the Agagite, which brings us to King Agag, who oversaw the Amalekites, who are direct enemies of the Jews. So centuries later, this sin that was in that family of King Agag is still in Haman. You've got some stuff in you that your great-great-grandparents struggled with. And you want to justify, you say, oh, it's just who, who I came from. Here's the second thing about sin. It's always selfish. It doesn't care about others. It only cares about you. Here's the third thing about sin. This is the most tragic and real. Sin will always lead to death. Paul said this in Romans chapter 6. He says, for the wages of sin is death. You will reap death when you choose sin over life. Now, Paul went on to say, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, this is free. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Which brings us to Esther. Esther teaches us about obedience. If you want the life that the Lord has to offer, you must be obedient to the Lord. Here's three things we learn of Esther in this story. Number one is when you give your life to Jesus, it changes your family destiny. Come on, somebody should have shouted amen there. Amen. Here's what that means. You're no longer defined by your DNA, but now you're defined by the very maker that made you in your mother's womb. All of a sudden, you realize the purpose in your life is the very maker that made you has a greater purpose and plan for you than you even understood. And here's the good news. It's never too late with God. You might be in your 80s. Oh, you go to the Bible. That's when God's just getting started with people. That should have spoke to somebody. I see that amen back there. God's just getting started. You say, well, I'm just a youth. You don't let anybody look down on you for your youth. You're never too young to do great things for God. God loves kids, and he wants to do great things for those who are going to be bold and courageous and be obedient to the Lord. You will break generational curses because here's what happens when you obey the Lord. It's no longer about you. You consider other people. And when you consider others, it's just natural in your heart. It's life-giving. Why do we go to Uganda? It's life-giving. You think you're blessing somebody else? Nope, they just blessed you. It's life-giving. Serve other people. It's life-giving. Here's the third one, and the most important is it always leads to life. Jesus put it this way to a religious person. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Some of you have been seeking after all the wrong things your entire life, career, success, sex. You've been going after these things, and the Bible says those things are pleasant for a season, but they're fleeting. They won't satisfy you. You're made for more. You're made for purpose. You're made to change the world. When, when the Lord gets into your heart, all of a sudden you see your purpose and the Spirit of God starts working and now you sin and you give that sin back to God immediately. He redeems it and now you start looking more like Jesus. Oh, how it changes everything. But you got two options and it's only up to you. No one else can change you. You can act like Haman or you can act like Jesus. And here's my encouragement to you today. It's time for you to start living like Jesus. Amen. Paul writes to the suffering Christians who were hurting. He says, for to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. This is Jesus. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That word tree is the same word for gallows. The Persian Empire, they made this tree that was a spike, and they would impale people on top of it. They would leave their body dead. Jesus was crucified on the gallows, crucified on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Well, here's the great exchange. You give your life to Jesus, he gives you his. Someone asked me after last service, what does that mean to be healed? It means you're healed of everything. You're healed of, of your hurts. You're healed of your sin. You're healed of your heartache. But they're like, but I'm suffering physically. You're even healed physically. They say, but I've been praying, I've been praying, I've been praying. Listen, God can heal you in just a moment, miraculously, right now. He is the great physician to heal. He can heal you today. And if that's you, I want you to believe that today he can heal you. If he doesn't, he's still God. And one day you'll be glorified that one day when you're in heaven... Everything that was wrong will be made right, and you're going to understand why God allowed you to suffer the way he is. It's not in vain. God has not overlooked you. Your pain is not absent. You are a tool that God wants to use. So I just want to close with this thought, and this is so important. I'll leave it here. This could be the title of today's sermon, but don't worry. I'm not just getting, I'm not starting the sermon. <laughs> this is the end, and this is, you can write this down today, and I say this to the end so you would understand it. Hang Haman on his own gallows. Do you understand what I mean by that? If Haman represents sin, crucify that sin right now. When that sin has, has been confessed, when that sin has been called out, and you know what that is because the Spirit of God has brought up to you what that sin is, you need to hang Haman on his own gallows, and you need to pray that prayer. God, what's in my life that shouldn't be there? Get rid of it. Listen, you made a mistake. It's okay if you did it in ignorance and unbelief. But once God has given you that belief, it's up to you to believe and be changed by God. He's a perfect gentleman. He wants you to obey him so that you would experience the life that he has to offer. And today, that's totally up to you. I want to invite the band up here right now as we just go to a time of response. And this is the most important part of the service. So I, I realize, especially this service, we get anxious. There's, there's lunchtime. But stick with me for just a couple more minutes. I have to ask you, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? If you've never surrendered your entire life to Jesus, today's your day. Some of you have gone to church your entire life, but you've never given your whole life to Jesus. And I need to tell you, right now, in this moment, you can do that. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for a better day. God's not asking you to get your life right first and then come to him. Instead, he's telling you right now, you come to me and I will change everything. So I want to give you that opportunity, but you must be bold. You do not have to have it figured out, but you do have to trust in the Lord with all your heart. You got to say, it's no longer my understanding. I'm giving my life to the Lord. I'll tell you today, it is the greatest decision you can ever make. Because when you do, your Father in Heaven is so happy. He's been longing for your heart. He's been waiting for this moment. You no longer have to wonder about eternity. You no have to, no have to wonder about all the things you've ever done wrong, the thoughts you've ever thought. They are forgiven by the Lord right now in this moment when you give your heart to Jesus. Every single sin, every hurt that was ever done to you, the Lord sees that and he wants to heal your heart. So I'm gonna ask you right now, I'm not even gonna ask you to close your eyes. I usually do at this point, but this, I'm just gonna ask you, this is serious. This changes everything and it won't be easy in your life, but I'll tell you, it's absolutely worth it. 
If you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time, if you wanna surrender it all, would you just throw up your hand right now? I wanna pray with you. You'd be bold and courageous. Throw up your hand right now. Let me, let me see that hand. Praise God, praise God. Yes, yes. Praise God, praise God. The Lord loves you so much. Right where you are, just raise, raise your hand if that's you saying, I need Jesus. I'm done doing it on my own. Amen. Praise God. He wants it right now in your heart. Praise God. Yes, yes. I tell you, there's no bigger smile than on God's face when he sees you say, I'm giving my life to the Lord. No greater joy. You know, David, he went through so many things. I'm talking about King David in the Bible. He says, the Lord takes me to green pastures. He takes me to still waters, but the Lord also lets me go through the hell, through the valley of the shadow of death. And then he says, after I've been through hell, through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, my cup overflows. You start to understand why God let you go through it. He's not against you. He's for you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to comfort you. Praise God. Praise God. God loves it when a young person gives his heart to the Lord. He's going to use you. He's got a great plan for your life. Anyone else? I don't I don't want to miss this, but I do want you on the outside to express what's happening in your heart. So many hands today, maybe even those watching online or listening to me right now. I'm going to pray. Now, here's, here's the cool thing about prayer. Some people make it bigger than it is. Prayer is just communication with God. It's talking to God. Now, now Jesus says you don't need eloquent words. You don't need to sound good. You don't need to repeat words. You don't need to repeat prayers. You just need to be real with God in your heart. So I'm going to say words and ask you all to say them out loud. But if you're praying that for the first time, it's not your words that save you. It's Jesus. So you believe in the one that we're talking to right now, right where you are. Would you pray with me? Say, say this out loud if you, if you believe these words today. Lord, I love you. I give you my heart. All of my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to live for what's right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, my friends, if you prayed that prayer, everything changed. It may not seem like it in this moment, but you just decided to wage war on an enemy of God. But I've got good news for you. There's victory in Jesus. You will never lose ever in Jesus. We want to know if you made that decision. Please let us know if you're here in person. Fill out a card on the seat backs and put it in one of the boxes before you leave. If you're watching online, we've got uh, moderators and people communicating with you. Make sure that you communicate with us. We want to just respond to God. Can you respond to God in your heart? Would you stand to your feet? Can we celebrate who God is? Can we turn our hearts to Him? This is your chance to pray bold prayers. This is your chance to say, Spirit, change me. This is your chance to give back to God what He's given you. Lord, we give you our hearts.
God, you promised that you would use them. And God, just like you did with Mordecai and Haman, and you took Haman's gallows and you crucified death there, in the same way, God, you've taken our sins on yourself. God, we give those things to you today. God, we take a step, we surrender, we say yes to your holiness. We say yes to the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We say yes to the pruning work of you, the master gardener. We say yes to the one who would be taking the pottery and shaping it and molding it. And we don't say no or refuse the one who has his hand on our life. God, yet we say yes. We say, God, we'll submit to the hand of the king. <laughs> 